And when Senator Harkin was retiring and I was in the House and running for the Senate, he called me over and he said, Tammy, I'm handing the reins over to you. (laughs) It's just sort of fallen to me to champion ADA issues, being a, a, a wheelchair user. Um, And then when Senator Harkin was retiring and I was in the House and running for the Senate, he called me over and he said, Tammy, I'm handing the reins over to you. (laughs) I'm handing the torch to you. You need to be the torch bearer and you need to really represent the entire disability community because you frankly wouldn't be here at the disability community not been there before you even became disabled. And he was absolutely right. I find myself being the go-to person on a lot of the ADA issues as they come up in Congress. I said yes, I was honored. I mean, to to be able to be handed the mantle from, from Tom Harkin is uh, quite the honor. And, you know, I, I don't know that I can Feel his shoes, but I I try every day to make sure I do my best to represent the community, but then also to just fight for basic common. And this is what I did, right? In the army, I fought for freedoms, I fought for people's rights, and this is just a basic human right Mm -hmm. to access the life that you want to access and live the life that you want to live and not be confronted by barriers at every turn. I have been working on burn pit issues for a very long time, and it and it started um, from just my own experience uh, being exposed to the burn pits in Iraq. We used to fly into Baghdad. <clears throat> we were stationed in in Balak in in, um, in Balad, and we would fly into Baghdad into the green zone. And if you were on the ground looking up, it always just the sky always just looked a little overcast. It didn't look anything, you know, ominous but flying through about a 50 foot, 100 foot layer of basically brown skies in the sky. We used to burn it, the air crew's lungs. So you go through there, you're like, oh man, mm. my eyes are watering, my lungs are burning. Mm. And I had always said there was gonna be some respiratory illnesses. And then I started working on Agent Orange issues within the VA and it was under President Obama and Secretary Shinseki that we finally um, granted uh, benefits to veterans based on presumptive benefits. So if you develop ischemic heart disease, if you develop leukemia B, um, and you were in Vietnam, we're going to presume that it's because of your Vietnam service. We, we no longer force veterans to, you know, prove that their illness was caused by Agent Orange. We just presume, and then and so that really started me working on burn pits after we were successful with the Agent Orange campaign. And so it's pretty much been continuous ever since, and I'm really glad we got the PACT Act passed. There's more work to do, but it's a great, 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 great first start. Yes, so I wrote a piece of legislation called the ASAP Act to make all of our transit stations accessible. All stations accessibility uh, program, ASAP. Um, I wrote it in this piece of legislation and introduced it in the Senate, coming out of my experience with the CTA, the Chicago Transit Authority, I was invited by the CTA when I was a Congresswoman um, on the 30th and on the 25th anniversary of the ADA. So we're at the 32nd anniversary. So seven years ago, they invited me to a ribbon cutting at a CTA station. And they were really proud, really, really, really proud that they were announcing that they were going to begin this program to make 100% of the Chicago Transit Authority stations, whether it was bus or rail, um, uh, fully accessible. And I said, this is great. When is this going to be done? He goes, well, it's a 25-year plan. And I looked at him, Dorval Carter, who's the president of the Chicago CT, and I said, so you mean a half century after the passage of the ADA? Yeah. When <laughs> <laughs> we, we can count on this? And then he went, well, wait, if you put it that way, it sounds terrible. I'm like, yeah, it is terrible. Number one, let me just say that it's great that you're doing this. And I said, why are we here 25 years later and when we still have stations that are not accessible? I still to this day don't use the L in, in Chicago because not all stations are accessible right. and, and you never know uh, um, if one is going to be or not. And he said, well, it's because we have a limited amount of money and ADA accessibility has always been a priority for us. It's always been in the top three, but we only have enough money for the top two. And when I have to choose between safety 
as in buying a new train car or safety equipment for the train car versus building a ramp, I'm going to choose buying new safety equipment for the train car. Mm -hmm. And I said, so what will fix that? Because well, you need to, you need, we need money that is sectioned off that cannot be used for anything else right. other than accessibility. And that would allow us to do this faster. So I said, like, great. So then I wrote the bill um, at, the, at the federal level. And when we were starting to work, um, when the President Biden was sworn in and, and Mayor Pete, sorry, uh, uh, <laughs> was, uh, uh, was appointed, I said, you know, and I've known him from previously. And I said, listen, we got to do this. We have to do this. And let me tell you what I'm trying to do. And I invited him out and he toured one of the CTA stations where this work was going. And I explained what we were trying to do. I said, we can make this happen in 10 years if we fund this. Mm -hmm. And so in the bipartisan infrastructure deal, we ended up losing half the money. Um, but, but we've got the first five years funded um, and, and uh, you need to support it. So he supported it. It was great because he elevated it. This was a priority. I was able to make it stay, even though I lost half the money, I was able to make it stay in the bipartisan infrastructure deal instead of it getting dropped. So this will be nationwide. So, so what we did was we put aside federal dollars that in first off the legacy system, but all transit systems can apply for to get those dollars to help them make all their stations accessible. Not just for like wheelchairs, but it's gotta be vision, hearing, cognitive disabilities as well. You know, um, when, when you have to buy a ticket and it's all touch screen and you, you know, that doesn't help somebody who has a, a visual impairment. Cognitive, if, if you don't make your app, I mean the cell phone app, something that, that is friendly for those with cognitive impairments, then, then it's not accessible. So this covers the full range of disabilities. Well, it's, it's certainly more partisan. Mm -hmm. um, and after January 6th, it's, it's been difficult, um, especially compared to my time in the House, where I had a lot of bipartisan work. I will tell you, though, that I've been able to be very bipartisan since I've been here in the Senate. Um, my, first, my first piece of legislation I passed at something like the 64-day mark, which was the fastest any senator had done it since the 70s. And I did it with Todd Young of Indiana, my next-door neighbor. And it was very um, bureaucratic, cutting red, through red tape and, and that had to do with municipal building projects. But we got that done. President Trump signed that into law. Um, I passed legislation to support veterans become entrepreneurs and, and that was bipartisan. President Trump signed that into law. Um, and it also will, that will also reduce costs for taxpayers. Since January 6th, though, it has become even more partisan here. So you really have to work to find people to work with. And sometimes you you find like folks to work with that you never expected to um, because you don't, you know, I'll give you an example. I just passed um, the Public Safety Officer Support Act and my partner in that was Senator Cornyn, actually Republican leadership from Texas. I don't have a lot in common with him, but it came out of January 6th where we have um, Officer Smith was one of the officers and we have him on record on body camera footage being um, uh, beaten um, and receiving concussive events at least three different times, two of which he passed out and it's on camera. Mm -hmm. um, and he went back to work two weeks later, got time off, went back to work, was told, you're fine, go back to work two weeks later. And within days, um, uh, ended up dying by suicide. Um, and that's when I found out through his widow that for our first responders, like the police forces, the Police Benefits Association is not allowed to consider post-traumatic stress as being a result of their job. Mm -hmm. And so, because he died by suicide, even though the coroner said this was because he had a, a concussive event and he had post-traumatic stress, he had damage to the part of his brain that controls emotions, and that his death by suicide was as a result of what happened on January 6th, his wife still lost all her benefits. And she found out she lost all of her widow's benefits standing in line at CVS to wow. get prescription medication. And I said, that is absolutely wrong. And I talked to John Cornyn and he joined me in it. And so we passed it in a bipartisan way, pro law enforcement, pro first responders, but really drawing on my work from VA. So when I went to John, I said, listen, here's what I know about post-traumatic stress in my work at VA. Will you work with me to help our police, uh, our, our first responders, you know, our public safety officers? Because this is crazy that they can't claim PTSD for as being a result of their job duties and mm -hmm. he supported me and we were able we had a couple folks who tried to shut it down on the republican side but because cornyn is 
Republican leadership, we were able to work our way through it and get to a yes. And I had to stare down one of my Republican colleagues and threaten to make him defend his position against public safety officers on the floor of the Senate. And he backed off. I won't tell you who it is, but I, I you know, because <laughs> he didn't want to be on record do that on the floor. So we, we got it passed. So we can get things done. Shelley May Capital helped me work on um, water infrastructure. I, I, I wrote the drinking water and wastewater portion of the bipartisan infrastructure deal. And that included in it significant dollars to get lead out of drinking water supply um, of grant programs. And she is on the same committee and I went to talk to her and I said, what do you think about this? And she said, well, you forgot all the people who are on well water. This system that you've, this grant program you've written allows municipalities to uh, get reimbursement and gives them dollars to fix these programs. But what about people who are on well water? Don't they deserve to not have lead? So I said, absolutely, mm -hmm. let's write that in. So we specifically wrote in the well water piece um, and we got 89 votes on the floor of the Senate because of it. And then I come later on to find out that I actually have people in Chicago who sue on well water. So it wasn't just people on well water across Illinois, which I knew about, but I even had people in urban areas who sue on well water. And mm -hmm. that was bipartisan. She made the bill better. She listened to me. And even though we rarely vote the same way on a lot of things, we got 89 votes on the bill and I'm really proud of it. There's hope, there's hope, yeah. Maybe fewer cameras watching us and people don't have to play up with the cameras. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We'll get more done, you know, more, less, less, less uh, people are needing to do this, you know. <laughs> yeah.